Praise God. Hallelujah. Now it's really hard to believe this is March. At what just seemed like the other day we were dealing with Christmas. And then all of a sudden January went, is gone. February, and don't even remember February, he was working every day almost. <laughs> it's just a, whew, it was gone. All of a sudden March is here, and now we're almost halfway through March. It's like, what is going on? And now we have this time change. For those that don't know it, that means you're going to have a little more light at the end of the day. And so it's been staying light till almost 7. And so now it's going to stay light till almost 8. And you're going to be able to do what you need to do almost up till 8 o'clock. Now think about it. That's a huge... Yeah, you say, well, well, I don't know if we can do that. It's going to be light enough to come to church tonight, I'm telling you. You're going to be able to get home and still be light. Praise God. Hallelujah. Somebody said, Amen. <laughs> Amen. Turn with me this morning to Mark chapter 11, and let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we prepare to open your word, I pray, Lord God, that you would use me. Lord, I yield myself to you, my spirit, soul, and body. I yield myself to you, my mind, my will, my intellect, my emotion, every part, Father, that it be all of you and none of me. And I pray, Lord God, that the word come out today with power. Let us receive your word as we hear these things this morning, that it be recognized from your spirit and Holy Spirit we ask that you touch this your word this morning and minister life to the people I pray father for miracles in this place this morning in Jesus name amen, amen. open your Bibles to Mark chapter 11 praise God Mark 11 hallelujah Mark 11 in verse 22 in Mark 11, in verse 22, it starts out like this, and it says, And Jesus answered. Who said this? Jesus. And Jesus answered. Who said this? I'm, okay, I'm, I know there's more than two people here. And Jesus, who said this? Jesus. All right, very good. <laughs> I want you to make sure you see this is in red letter because I didn't make this up. I've been accused of making some of this stuff up, but I didn't make this up. This is actually in the Bible. Mark 11 and 22, it says, and Jesus said this, have faith in God. Now, this is really interesting because if you read it in the literal Greek, it says, have the faith of God. Now, that's a real interesting composite there to have faith like God's faith. Have the same faith in the same way God has faith. He says, hold yourself in a manner to have the same kind of faith that God has. Hold yourself in a manner to have faith like God has faith. And it says in verse 23, Verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Now some people have to pause there and say, That's really in there? Is that really in there? You can say to the mountain, be removed, and not doubt it in your heart, and believe that what you said will come to pass. You, I'm telling you what, I didn't say that. Jesus said that. That's in red. You just got finished quoting. That's a red letter edition. That's what Jesus said. Faith involves saying. Now, some people think, well, I'm just having faith, so I'm going to believe that my fingernails will grow. And they grunt and... How many ever had your fingernails grow because you grunted? How many ever got your hair to grow because you squeezed? <laughs> it, it, it's not going to happen. Faith comes by saying. <laughs> See, we've been confused. Well, how's faith supposed to work? Well, right here, faith comes by saying. You've got to say something. Faith involves saying. And, and it says in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 13, it says, We having the same spirit of faith is written... We having the same spirit of faith is written. They have spoken. We have the same. Let's just turn there. You got to see this in your Bible. Second Corinthians. Don't lose your place there in Mark. But look at Second Corinthians and verse four. We having the same spirit of faith. Look what it says in verse four, or chapter four and verse thirteen. It says, "We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written." I believed, and therefore I have spoken. If you believe, what are you supposed to do? Speak. If you believe, what are you supposed to do? Speak. Come on, I'm helping somebody. If you believe, what are you supposed to do? Speak. So today, this is a, gro a group of people that got together. We're called believers. What are you supposed to do? Speak. All right. <laughs> 
believers speak according to as is written, I believed and therefore I've spoken, and we also believe and therefore speak. So faith involves speaking. Now turn back to Mark, Mark chapter 11. Faith involves speaking, and it says so in verse 23. It says faith involves speaking. Don't lose your place there. I want you to just remind you what happened in Genesis. Anybody remember how the world was created? The Bible says, and God said and it was done, and God said, and it was done, and God said. So if it says, have the faith of God, have the God kind of faith, what kind of faith does God use? He speaks it. So if it says in 2 Corinthians you're supposed to speak it, and it says in Genesis you're supposed to speak it, and right here in Mark it says you're supposed to speak it, what do you think we ought to do? All right, very good. So faith involves speaking. However, I've been criticized for this. I've been criticized by the best you can imagine to be criticized by. People say, oh, well, you're just one of them name it and claim it kind of guys. I didn't make this up. This is it's what Jesus said. He said, you say to the mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea, not doubt it in your heart. Believe what you say will come to pass and you can have what you say. You've got to believe. You've got to believe. This is why we're called believers. You've got to believe. Now, what do we believe in? We believe exactly like that to get born again. The Bible says you believe, with your, you believe with your heart and you say it with your mouth. And if you believe in your heart that God would raise Christ from the dead and say it with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. It promises you that. Well, in the same manner that you're born again, it says you're supposed to live your life like that. Look with me. And, well, let me just read this. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, it says, As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk ye in Him. In the same manner that you receive Christ, walk in Him, live in Him, stay in Him. In the same manner you received Him, you're supposed to live your life like that from then on. That's what it says in the Greek. Live your life in the manner, in the same way you receive the Lord. Now, let me say it again. How do we receive the Lord? You've got to believe in your heart, and then you say it with your mouth. Well, how many know that's how you got born again? That's how they get born. The Bible says, believe it in your heart, say it with your mouth, you shall be saved. You get born again that way. Then it says, go on and live your entire life that way. Don't just do it one time. Many people get saved, and that's the end of their faith adventure. Because they say, well, I'm not, I don't have to do that again. No, you don't have to do that again. But you're supposed to live your life in that same manner. In that same manner. You believe it in your heart, you say it with your mouth. You're supposed to do that not only here in this world, but in the world that is to come. Somebody say, you, you got to be kidding. We're going to use faith in heaven? Yes. Yes. What do you think we're here for? Training. <laughs> we're here training. We're getting schooled on how to make your faith work. Somebody says, well, I can't wait to get to heaven because I, I can see my faith work there. Well, yes, there's no resistance to faith there, but you're going to have resistance here. This is where you have a training ground. Wherever there's resistance, there's training involved. And that's what we're doing. Because anybody ever work out? If you've ever worked out, there's no training unless there's, come on, help me, resistance. Come on. And that's what this training is for. There's got to be some resistance. So when you get to heaven, you will have learned how to use your faith properly. Amen. Now, walk ye in him. It's not just for being born again. It is the manner in which he told us to operate everything that's in our life. He told us to walk this way. How do you get born again? You say it with your mouth after you believe it in your heart. You believe it in your heart, you say it with your mouth. Now this is going to take some people by surprise. But the Bible is several scriptures that tells us there's other things that you're supposed to walk ye in him in the same manner. Several things it talks about. And people say, well, well what do you mean? Do you know that you can receive healing in the same manner? People say, well, you know, God just heals whoever he wants to heal. I mean, that's, that's God's business. Well, yeah, but there's a little catch to that. He already, the Bible says, he already bore our sicknesses and carried our griefs, it says in 1 Peter 2.24, and with his stripes were healed, it says in Isaiah 53, in chapter, 53rd chapter and verse 4. It says, with his stripes you're healed. Somebody says, oh, wait a minute, you're telling me that i got to use my faith to get my healing? See, there, part of that is godly. you got to use your faith now to receive your healing. And the faith part is the speaking part. Some people say, well, I don't know exactly how faith works. Boy, I'm glad you're here. We're going to exp 
explore that this morning. The Bible says this is the way you get filled with the Spirit. Some people have heard that and they said, well, I'm not sure about that filling with the Spirit stuff. Hey, I'll tell you what. Until I got filled with the Spirit, I didn't know a whole lot about the Lord. I just, I, I was on a church uh, staff and I was doing stuff for God, but I didn't know anything about the Lord. I was as green as they come. And when it came to read my Bible, I said, hey, I read a scripture Sunday, isn't that enough? I, hey, I was on a church staff. And, and I thought reading your scripture meant that you had to kind of just look in the Bible and, and point at a scripture and read it. Whatever it was, that's what God's trying to tell you. I had no idea you could study on there and find some things to explore. I just thought that the scripture was just for whoever would take time and, and find something, then maybe it'll work for you. I did not know he's trying to show us something. Are you with me? So my life was really laid out in a confusing manner until I was filled with the Spirit. And something happened. Inside me, I realized there's a whole lot more to God than I know. And the more I studied, the more I realized, I'm pretty dumb. <laughs> I don't know very much about the spiritual things. I thought, well, I'm, I'm way high according to my own eyes, but I found out something. I was way low according to God's eyes. I just was, I was green when it came to anything spiritual. And before, I would say, well, Somebody wants to talk about the Bible, I'd say, mm, can't you save that for Sunday? But after I got spirit-filled, it was like, I can't get enough Bible. Somebody's talking about it, I'm saying, let me in the conversation, I've got to talk about that. How come that happened? I realized something. The Spirit lives inside me. And the Bible says He leads and guides you into all the truth. And so when He is in that truth mode, which He is all the time, he wants to help guide me in the things of the Spirit. And He does the same thing for you. Walk in that same manner. One thing that we ought to be privy of is this. God intends for us to have finances. Somebody said, well, you know, now you're into that prosperity message. Ah, oh, you've just turned on me, preacher. Now you just went somewhere else. Well, I was reading all through the Bible. It says like this. It says that God wishes above all things that we prosper and be in hell. And then it goes on and says, He wants to give us wealth to help establish the covenant. And then it goes on and says something like this, Jesus was made poor that we might be very rich. And I put all these scriptures together and somebody says, well, you know, you just pulled those out of, out of context. I didn't pull them out of context. He says that everything ought to be justified by two or three witnesses. And so I found at least a dozen places that says we're supposed to have finances. And according to the scriptures, it says He wants us to have every need met according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And somebody told me that being poor is okay with God. Well, I don't find that to be true. Because if you can't help yourself, you can't hardly help anybody else. <laughs> it's hard to give when you have to try to just barely make ends meet. Are you with me? So I told the Lord, what does it take to learn these things? He said, there's something that most people miss, and that's the operation of faith. Faith is not just how you got born again. Faith is an operation that we're supposed to learn while we're here. That's what the Scripture says. And so today, I want to explore that just a little bit and really kind of justify a couple of things about our life. Now, if you're born again, and I believe that most of us are, that's why we're here today, because we're called believers. Believers gather together. Believers are born again. Now, let me ask you a question. How do you know that you're born again? Anybody seen your name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life? Anybody ever seen your mansion in heaven? Anybody ever have an angel show up and say, I was just talking to Jesus, and he said, sure enough, you're born again? I mean, what kind of confirmation have you got? The Bible says that you got this confirmation. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. There's no more confirmation to it. It's an irrefutable fact that if you believe in your heart and you confess it with your mouth, you are saved. This is what God promises. This is what He gave us. This is how He told us. This is what we receive. Now some people say, well, I've done that. I've done that part, so I've received Christ. But there's more to it. He says if you do just that, you're not doing enough. You see, we believe God that we're born again before we could see it, before we could feel it, before we could touch it. Before anybody told us this is the way it is. We believed we received it before it happened. In the same manner, we're to receive our needs met. In the same manner, we're to receive our healing. In the same manner, we're to receive all the things, the good things from God. He's laid out good things for our life. He wants us to have the blessing. 
And some people say, well, I can't, I can't hold out for that on everything. He's supposed to have us blessed in the same manner that you have received your spiritual eternity is the same manner you're supposed to walk ye in him. And the word gives us clarity and gives us light. Now look at verse 24. And it goes on and says, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. Now there's something very important about verse 22 and verse 23. Verse 22 says, you're supposed to find something in your life that you don't want. And you say to that thing, go, get out of my life. I, I don't need you. I don't want you. You get out of here. Stop it. And in verse 24, it says, then what things you desire, you're supposed to claim those into your life. Now think about this for a minute. Is there anything in your life that you don't want hanging around? Somebody said, well, I, I, I can't be real favorable about, about sickness. Well, that's true. <laughs> if you're not favorable about sickness, you're supposed to tell sickness, get out of here. And what should you be calling to your body? Healing. So people say, wait a minute, you can toss something out you don't want by, by talking to it and bring something to you that you do want by talking to it. That's faith in operation. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. We're supposed to hold on to this. Faith is not just believing. And what do we believe? Well, some people say, well, I believe God is real. I believe in his son, Jesus. Hallelujah. And I believe that, that God wants to take care of me. Hallelujah. And that's all good. But the next verse says right there in verse 24, believe that you receive. Oh, that's different. Believe that you receive. That's personal, that's specific, and that's now. Believe that you receive. Personal and specific and now. Believe that you receive them. Now. He said, believe whatsoever things you desire. That's personal. You desire whatsoever things. That's personal. You desire. That's personal. Be specific when you desire. Specific. And then he said, believe that you receive them now. And he said, and you shall have them. It's not all up to the Father. You're part of the faith factor. You've got to use your mouth. He said that you've got to believe in your heart. You've got to say it with your mouth. It's going to be this way all your life. Now, I've been around a lot of Christians that have done some interesting things, especially when I was in a denominational church. And they get together around the altar. And they'd, they'd cry and they'd wail and they'd beg, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. I can remember saying, oh God, for 30 minutes. And the only thing happened was I, my vocal cords got tired. <laughs> because God already knew he's oh God. Uh, but if you just say, oh God, you never really say anything that you desire. And you never really get rid of anything that you don't want. I was just crying out to God. And God knows if I'm crying out. He already says he knows these things. He knows these things. But he expects you to use your faith. And this is where we come in having to make a difference. You've got to use your faith. In Romans 6 and verse 10, look over there. Or let's look at Romans 10 and verse 6. Romans 10. Praise God. Romans 10 says this in verse 6. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh. Now what does righteousness do? It speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. He said, don't say that. Don't say that. Christ, will you come down and help me? Oh, God, come down. Oh, God, come and help me. He said, don't say that. He's already willing to help. He said, don't make it sound like he's not going to be there. And then he says, he goes on, he says, and don't say this, who's going to send down in the deep and bring Christ up from the dead. He said, don't say that. You don't know where Christ, you act like you don't know where Christ is when you say, that, oh, God, come help me from somewhere. He said, don't say that. And then he goes on and says this, this is what you say, the word is nigh thee. It's in thy mouth and in thy heart. How'd you get born again? Is in your mouth and in your heart. That's the same way you get anything from the Lord, in your mouth and in your heart. He said, in your mouth and your heart, and that is the word of faith which we preach. Now, some people have said, wait a minute. I've heard about them word of faith preachers. I know about them word of faith preachers. Paul was the original word of faith preacher. <laughs> 
He just, he tagged himself and said, that's the word of faith that we preach. And I'm going to tell you something. I believe that we're supposed to hang on to a word of faith. Somebody said, you know, I, I have a, a problem with you hanging on to faith all the time. The only problem I have is you think that God is so big and so wonderful, he's just going to do whatever you ask. Now, I don't believe that. But if I can find it in the Word and He's made a promise for it, I'll tell you what, I can claim it. And somebody said, it may not be always that way. Well, we make excuses if we don't seem to have it working in our own life. Now, isn't that true? But the truth of it is, if God made a promise for it, He intended for me to have it. And I'm going to say it until I receive it. Because, until I see it, because I've already received it. This is what the Bible says. You believe in your heart and say with your mouth. And Isaiah... 53 and 5, I'm going to read this for you. Isaiah 53 and 5, I've said this before, but I'm going to read it to you now. It says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of, his peace was, was, of our peace was upon Him, and with His stripes we are healed. I'm going to claim that and claim that and claim that. I claim that because that's what the Scripture says. He gave us an opportunity to believe a Scripture for healing in our body. And somebody says, I I'm not sure you can always claim that. Well, I'm going to claim that because that's the Word of God. That's the Word of faith that we preach. Amen. Now, the Bible goes on, and let me read this. In Romans chapter 10, and let's look down at verse 10. It says, For the heart of a man believeth unto righteousness, and it says, With his mouth confession is made into salvation. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Amen. And then it goes on in verse 12 and says, There's no difference now between the Jew and the Greek, and the same Lord is over all. He's, and, and it says that the same Lord is over all, and he's rich into all that call on him. What he says is, there's no difference in how you got born again, whether you're Jew or whether you're Greek, whether you're black, whether you're white. It makes no difference. You all get born again the same way. Now, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everyone. He said anybody. This, this violates some of those churches that say there's only going to be 144,000 saved. And I have met some of those people that believe that the church is, is locked into an exact number of people to be saved. How many folks do you think have lived on the earth until now? There's definitely a lot more than 144,000, are you with me? So I think that when I've heard people talk like this, they think there's a chosen elite, an elect few that's going to make it to heaven. And that's not what the Bible says. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then it goes on and says... How shall they call on him in whom they have believed? And how shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Oh, how good the day I heard the Lord call me and say I was supposed to be a preacher. And how shall they preach except they be sent? And then it goes on and is written, Beautiful are the feet of those that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. You know, when I first got filled with the Spirit, I had some interesting things happen to me. I got uh, robbed a couple of times at gunpoint. I like within a few days after I got born again or filled with the Spirit. And I said, uh, you know, I'm not afraid of those things. My wife said, I think you ought to choose another profession that might be a little bit safer. <laughs> so I walked away from that particular profession. I took another profession. I started to work for a company called Pittman Manufacturing to make these big hydro hydraulic cranes. And it's owned by Emerson Electric, and they make big hydraulic cranes. I went to work out there as a stockman. And so I was starting to work with the stockman at the order desk. And so I was working at the order desk, and I found some ways and some things that need to be changed. And sure enough, they promoted me, and they promoted me. And next thing you knew, within a few months, I was the assistant director of sales. Now somebody says, you mean to tell me that just happened? I know it was the Holy Spirit. He just moved me clean out of the back room all the way up to the top floor. It's like, it had to be the work of the Holy Spirit. You just don't have this happen that quickly. And I moved all the way up to the top floor. But I knew something was happening inside my spirit. I knew that the Lord was dealing with me. I'd sit up in my office up there, but I could hear the Holy Spirit talking to me. Even though I was doing my work, I was totally I was in, in, engulfed by the fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit talking with me. And every day he'd talk with me. Came so often to me all the time. I'd ride back and forth to work with a guy called Ernie. And Ernie would listen to me talking about the Lord. And finally he says, you know, why don't you ask them at, at, at work if they'd let you use the conference room. And maybe you could have a little Bible study in there. And the light went off. And I said, what if I had a Bible study at lunchtime? And I invited everybody to bring their sack lunch. And the lunch room, the, the conference room would seat 60 people. 
Can you imagine the one table, the, how long it was for this big old office for 60 people to sit around? And I went to the boss and I asked him, what do you think if I could, because Ernie put a good word in for me because he was an engineer at this particular plant, and he put a good word in for me, and so they opened up the conference room for me to minister, to talk to people. Not, they didn't call it minister, to talk to people about God. And folks knew that's what I was doing over a sack lunch at work. They let me go into work and sit there and open my Bible every day and preach to those people that would come into that lunch room. I mean, I, I, I told them everything I knew in 15 minutes. I mean, it was, it was everything, I ever ta- everything I ever learned. I'd, I'd come every day loaded for bear, something else, something else, something else. And I'd just share with them, let them start their lunch, pile it on, and they'd finish their lunch, and we'd go back to work. And every day I'd give it to them. Oh, God was good to me. I could... I could feel His Holy Spirit ministering to me, and He talked to me, He talked with me, and I was feeling powerful just sitting in that room. And then the Lord said, I want you to go off and study how to be a minister full time. And I heard that. And I said, oh, God, you want to call me full time into ministry? I was so humbled. I went to my boss and I said, I'm going to have to leave. I know the Lord is calling me to full time ministry. I have to go study. And I said, I'm going to stay here two more weeks. I'm giving my two-week notice. So they called the big boss and told him, the, the president of Emerson Electric. And he shows up. And he calls me in his office. And he says, what is this? We just promoted you all the way down from a stock boy. You're the assistant sales director. And now you want to leave me? And I just preached to him for about 35 minutes. And I told him where I was. And he said, his wife was sick. Could I please pray for her? <laughs> And I just took his hands right there in that room and just prayed for his wife and just cast out devils that were trying to influence him or influence her with infirmity and desired that healing would come on her body right now. And I'd use these same scriptures from Mark 11, 23 and 24 and desired healing to come on her body right now in the name of Jesus. And he was so moved, he started to cry. And he said, we'll let you go. We'll let you go. We're going to have a party for you before you leave. I said, well, okay. So it came time for me to go. Sure enough, they called us into the conference room. Said, we're having a little cake in there for you. Walked in the conference room. They had a cake on there. It's almost four feet long. It was to serve all the people in the conference room, not only the people that had come to my Bible study, because I got to teach there for several months. It started out with two, and then it went up to ten, And by the end of the time I was done, the whole conference room was full of letting people hear me preach. I just was so humbled. I didn't know anything. I knew one thing. Jesus is Lord. And they let me preach that, but on this cake was written, Beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel. And they all shook my hand. And they all acknowledged, You're called into the Lord, the service of God. All I had done was shared with them the fullness of what God had done for me. That's all I knew. But I knew this. There's more to God than I ever could imagine. I want to find out from the depths of the Lord what is the fullness that He wants us to live here on the earth. And I believe that during this last day, we're supposed to find out what God has called us for. The fullness of of living the Spirit-filled life, and not just get a job and have enough to pay our bills, but really have enough to live the life so that we're honoring God with all that we are. And I told him, that's exactly what I plan to do. Now, some people have trouble with a church that shares the gospel. You say, oh no, that can't be true. Oh, I've had people say, why don't you open feeding programs? I mean, if you have a feeding program, we'd give them to your church. Well, feeding's good. I've had other people tell me, why don't you have some kind of clothing program? If you had a clothing program, why would give into your church? If you had canned goods you gave away, I'd give into your church. And I said, well, we want to share the gospel. Oh, I don't want to give into your church. Oh, wait a minute. What about the Great Commission? It doesn't say, go ye therefore and make sure they have canned goods. It's, <laughs> it says, go ye therefore and preach the gospel. It's, this is the commission of God. It was not just the commission of men. We look at all the little areas that we can give to people, community projects, and we think, well, that's going to be the blessing of God. The blessing of God is sharing the gospel. 
Everything else is just a gimme. That's a secondary thing. Look with me in John chapter 8. John 8. Praise God. Hallelujah. John 8. Is it okay to try to go to church and not be a believer? Wait a minute. Let's look at John chapter 8 and verse 24. I said, this is in red, it says, I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am He, you're going to die in your sins. Now wait a minute. This is what Jesus said. He said, if you don't believe, you're going to die in your sins. Is it a big deal to be a believer? Absolutely. I think we've limited ourselves in what a believer really is. A believer is next to God. If you don't believe in Christ, you're going to die in your sins. I've heard people say, well, in fact, just the other day, Two guys were working on air conditioners. One of them said the other one, and they got so mad they started using explicit language. Are you with me? And they started, they, and one of them threw a wrench at the other one and hit him in the shoulder instead of him catching it. And he called him everything but a person. And, and, and by the time it got done, I mean, they were tossing tools at one another on top of a roof. And they had to get down off the roof and go get the tools. And finally, they start laughing and stuff when they finally got down and stuff. And the other one says, you know, you're being a real bad boy. He says, yeah, yeah. He said, you'll probably end up in hell. And the other one says, well, I'll meet you there. <laughs> and the other one says, we're going to have drinking buddies in hell. And they were just laughing. Is it all right to talk about hell in that manner? No, because I don't want to go there. If you've ever had a glimpse of what hell really looks like, I've talked with a couple people said they had a glimpse of what hell really looks like. Oh, it's no place I want to go. <laughs> It's nothing I want to be a part of. Hell is not for the person that believes. And what is a believer? This goes on and says, what is a believer? The Bible says life and death is in the power of the tongue. Heaven and hell is not something just to talk about. We're supposed to go to heaven, and we're, not, we're supposed to do everything to shun hell. Amen. So now, a believer, a believer, how close is that to faith? How close is believing to faith? Believing is really strong, close to faith. Believing and faith are really close. The difference between the two is believing is a verb and faith is a noun. But as far as defining them both, they're very close to one another. Because you hear people say like this, what does it mean to believe? Believe means to have faith. <laughs> it's virtually important to understand these two are, are very close. Faith is when you're totally persuaded of God's reality and integrity. It's his trust in him and in his word. And finally, it's having confidence in what he says and done. Turn with me to John, 1 John chapter 5. 1 John 5. Praise God. 1 John chapter 5. And look at verse 1. 1 John 5 and verse 1. It says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that... And everyone that loveth him, that, be, that begot, everyone, let me start over. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him, that be, begatteth love him, and all, also that is begotten of him. Wow, praise God. <laughs> that took me a while, glory to God. Having faith in God, it's very important. It requires that we believe before we see it. Are you with me? It requires you believe before you see it. Now go on down to verse 5. This would be a whole lot easier to read. It says, Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Who's a believer? One, it says believers overcome the world. Who's that believer? You believe that Jesus gave you the power to overcome the world. I'll tell you what. When you leave this life, there'll be no atheists. Somebody said, well, I'm an atheist. Well, I'm an agnostic. You leave this life, there's no atheist. They stand before God, and they're going to say, well, I was an atheist. And he's going to say, you was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you made the wrong choice there. There's no atheist after death. Are you with me? Believe in God. Verse 9. Look at verse 9. This is chapter 5 and verse 9. It goes on and says, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater for this is the witness of God that, it says, which he hath testified of his Son. And he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. And he that believeth not on the Son, it says, God, he hath made God a liar. Wow, if you don't believe on the Son of God, you've made him into a liar. Do you mean to tell me 
That if you don't believe in God, you're saying, well, I, I, I understand you said some things. You tried to announce some things to me, but I just don't believe you. I, I, I just can't understand. I, I can't really believe. I don't have confidence in your sayings. You don't have faith in God? I don't have confidence in your sayings. I can't believe that what you're telling me is true. He said, in the same manner that you got born again, walk in Him. Do you think to say that if you don't receive the rest of the stuff that God has for you, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the working of miracles, the healings for your life, the prosperity, that perhaps you might say, looking in the face of God, I just don't believe you. I try to believe you, but I just can't believe what you're telling me. In other words, you might be saying to God, I'm sorry, but I think you're a liar. Wow. You think that that's possible? You think that that's really true? Oh, I do. In fact, that's what the Bible says. It's so true, it's very true. It goes on and says this. I've got time just to read a couple of them to you. Now, hang on. I'll see if I find you a couple of verses here. In John 6, 35, it says, And Jesus said unto them, I'm the bread of life, and he that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. And this I say unto you, that also... Also, those that have seen me, but there's some that have seen me and believe not. You mean to tell me that there's some people that even have watched the working of God, the miracles of Jesus Christ, and did not believe? Absolutely. And there's some people today that even though Christ is making real of himself and real, we've lived the life, there's some people that would deny him and deny that he's real, deny that he works, and deny the fullness of Christ here on the earth. And it goes on and says in John chapter 5 and verse 7, there were some of his brothers did not even believe him. Wow. And it goes on in John chapter 8 and verse 45, and it says, I'm going to tell you the truth. You have not believed in me. You have been convinced. You have been convinced you're in your sins. And I say this is the truth. You don't even believe in me. Now some people say, this is, this is real. There are some folks that don't believe in Christ. They don't believe in Christ at all. This morning, I want you to work with me as I give you one last scenario. I'm going to pick uh, my friend here. Dan is my friend. I've known him for a long time. Dan, I know, and I'm going to use this as an example only. This is not your real spirit, but this is, this is what I'm saying to Dan. Dan, I want to give you something. I've known you for a while, and I really feel compelled of God I feel that God's moved on my heart, and I want to give you something. I want to give you maybe a, a BMW 750Li. Would that be all right? Yeah. He says, no, that's going to be all right. And I said, now, Dan, I've got to go out of town for the next month, and I'm going to be gone for a while. I've got to speak in New York, so I'm going to be gone for a while. So I bought this car, and it's a 750Li. Now, it's, it's a really nice car. It's in silver. It's got a real black interior, but it's in silver on the outside. It's got nice chrome wheels. It gets about 22 miles to the gallon. It gets 40 miles on the freeway. It's a real nice car. You're going to like it a lot. It cost me a little over $100,000. It's going to be a nice car. You're going to enjoy that. Now, here's what I've done for you. I've given you this, this 750Li. It's a real nice car. There's only one catch to this, Dan. I want you to understand this. It, I've got it at a, a dealership in L.A. I couldn't get the deal that I wanted here in town, so I had to buy it in L.A. As a matter of fact, it's in Thousand Oaks. And, I, and I've given this to you. They know you're coming. They know your name. All you've got to do is give them your name, and the car is waiting for you. And you say, okay, that's nice. I appreciate that. It's a 750 L.I. I went out of my way. I personally bought it. I paid for it. It's completely paid for. It's done. It's sitting down. And it's all yours. And Dan says, oh, I appreciate that. That's great. He says, you know what? I'm just going to tell you something. Don't kid me like that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like when you do me like that. I just don't like that kind of conversation. It's just messing up my mind. I don't want you to talk to me that way anymore. How dare you lie to me? And then I feel to myself, wait a minute. The least you could do is at least say thanks. <laughs> and he says, wait a minute, you know, I appreciate all that stuff, but I, I'm frankly, I don't believe you. I, I don't believe you. And I got this thing sitting down in L.A. at Thousand Oaks. It's at the Thousand Oaks Motors. I'd like you to go down there and pick up this BMW 750 Li. I got it. It's a nice silver. You're going to love the thing. It's a little over $100,000 vehicle. It's ready for you, Dan. Now, the least, he, he might get excited and say, oh, great, yippee. And he even clap his hands a couple of times and say, yippee, tell his wife and everything, go home and tell his kids, and they're all excited. And, and you know, a couple weeks go by, and Dan's still talking about it. Hallelujah, you know, he gave me that car. Glory to God. Dan's never going to enjoy that car. How come? Huh. 
That's the problem with most Christians. They believe it, but they don't believe they receive it. What's he got to do to receive it? He's got to get it. He's got to get it. The problem is, even with healing, some people say, well, I heard about that healing. You got to get it. Well, is there a way? We read Mark chapter 11 and verse 23. It says, say with your mouth. It says, say to this mountain, be that removed, be cast the sea, not doubt in your heart. Believe what you say will come to pass. You'll have whatsoever you say. And verse 24 says, the things you desire, whatsoever you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. You've got to believe something, believe you receive, and you've got to say it with your mouth. The only way he's going to receive that thing is he's got to say, hey folks, listen, I got this car and I'm going down there to get it. Now, if he really believed me, he wouldn't be waiting two weeks and still going, hallelujah, praise God, that's really nice, I appreciate that. He'd be getting on the bus and he'd be heading off to Thousand Oaks because he's going to pick him up a 750 LI. And he's going to drive that thing home and he's going to drive it all the way back here and he's going to drive up in the yard of somebody he does not know. And he's just because he wants to say, I got this thing, I got this thing. Are you with me? Now some of us would say, I don't understand that. The deal is, you're never going to receive something until it has been given to you. You've been given things from the Lord. And you've got to hear this. You've got to hear this. He wouldn't know that I was giving him this unless I said it. Are you with me? Because if I didn't say it, he wouldn't know it was given to him. But the moment I say it, the moment I say it, he's got he's to just make this opportunity. Ooh, then I can receive what he said. This is how faith comes. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word. If he hears me say it, it gives him faith and it honors me when he believes my word. Now, this is before he sees the car. He might say, well, I believe different than that. And I say, what do you mean? He says, well, I believe if somebody wants to give me a car, then they need to drive it over to my house to give it to me. And I'm not going to believe you gave it to me until it shows up in the driveway. How silly it is for Christians to even hold on like that and believe. And, but there are a lot of Christians that believe that's the way you receive healing. As soon as I get the healing, then I know I got it, so I don't have to believe for it anymore. Hey, if you already got it, you don't have to believe for it. If you, gotta be if you believe when you don't see it, are you with me? And that's why you're called a believer. Because you believe it before you see it. How do you get healing? In the same manner that you got saved. How do you receive prosperity? In the same manner that you got saved. How do you receive anything from God? You believe, you receive it, and you shall have it. Are you with me? Let's pray. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus that you've ministered life to us this morning. And we are completely sold on this, Father. We understand that there's a ministry involving our words. And we use our faith, Father, and speak to these things that have kept us from receiving from you before and move us towards receiving from you now. And we thank you for it in the name of Jesus. I pray, Lord God, if there's someone here this morning that does not know you, they've never said with their mouth, Jesus is my Lord. They've never believed in their heart, Christ raised from the dead. But they would say this morning, I want to believe in my heart. I want to say with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. I believe it in my heart. And they want to be saved this morning. They just raise their hand right where they are and I can pray for them. They receive Christ this morning. Receive the Lord this morning. Anybody? Praise God. Second invitation. You've heard some things this morning, but you have not been operating your faith in the same manner that it says in the Bible. Faith operates by speaking. If you understand that, that faith works by speaking, but you've got to speak something. You've got to say something. Let me say this to you. If you intend to use your mouth more than you've ever used it, and call those things in your life you don't want to leave, and call those things to your life that you do want to come, and you want to have more control on what you say, you asking the Lord for the fullness of control on your mouth. I want you to raise your hand, and I want to pray for you this morning so that you might know you have the power of God to speak the word of the Lord. Father, I pray this morning for every person that raises their hand and says, I want more control on my mouth, and call those things in my life to go away that I do not want, calling those things to my life that I do want. And I pray for victory, as you promised by your word. Victory is in, it's not far from me, it's in my heart and in my mouth. It's the word of faith that we preach. I receive that in my life, and I thank you, Lord, for guarding over 
over my mouth and my tongue, and I'll use it wisely in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Come back tonight at 5.30. Pastor Jenny's going to preach tonight. She's got about an hour, and it's a wonderful time. I want you to be here. Please come, and you'll enjoy yourselves. And don't forget Easter Sunday morning service. We're having a great time, and we're going to have a skit, and we're having a nice time to tell people about Christ. Come and be a part, and we'll see you tonight. God bless you, and you're dismissed.